Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who for our sake gave yourself up into the service of your parents, and to teach us true humility, carried by your mother into the temple, and there redeemed with the offerings of the poor, when the righteous Simeon and the prophetess Anna, gladdened by your presence, gave glorious witness concerning you. May the slightest breath of vanity never affect my innermost soul. May all arrogance be ever cast down. May all longing for the praise of men be extinguished. May all wantonness of self-conceit be quenched within me. Give me grace, O Lord, to flee any honour, to hate distinction, and to submit myself with readiness to all men for your sake. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who as a little child did with your tender mother suffer persecution and did not refuse to be carried as an exile fleeing into Egypt. Give me grace amidst the storms of adversity and the blasts of persecution and in misfortune to fly for refuge to you alone, to seek you, to call upon you. Grant that I may receive all things with gladness at your hands, may endure all things in meekness of heart, and may cleave with thanksgiving without wavering to you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you remained behind in the temple, your mother sought for sorrowing, and at length with joy found you sitting in the midst of the doctors, hearing and asking them questions. May you so give and communicate yourself to me, that I may never be separated from you, and never be without the comfort of your blessed friendship. Drive sloth from my heart, dispel any dullness that is displeasing in, my, in your sight. Grant me perfect devotion, and such an ardent thirst after piety, that my soul may be so affected and possessed by it, as never to feel satisfied with worshipping you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, who gave yourself up to live in concealment for thirty years, to be reputed by the Jews the son of Joseph the carpenter, and be subject to the commands of your mother and the same Joseph. May your grace, I beg you, root out and thoroughly pluck up from the innermost recesses of my heart, any ambition and seeking of glory, that I may become belittled in my own eyes, and may love to be unknown and considered of no account, submitting myself to all, and obeying them for your honour. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who did not refuse to come to the River Jordan, and be baptised there by your servant John. May you thoroughly cleanse me by your merits in this life, that freed from all vices and sins, I may be filled with the love of you and long for my heavenly country. Make me, I beg you, before my soul quits this body, pleasing to you in all things, that, departing from this life, I may be for ever in heaven with you, to see you to enjoy you and to praise your holy name for ever and ever. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who for our sake dwelt in the wilderness amongst the wild beasts, and fasted and watched in prayer for forty days and forty nights, permitting yourself to be tempted by the devil, whom you overcame when angels came and ministered to you. Grant me grace to discipline, overcome, and bring into subjection my sinful flesh with its evils affection, evil affections. Give me grace to be instant in prayer and all other spiritual exercises, and grant that with your continual help I may completely overcome sins of gluttony and may escape the snares and schemes of the devil. Let no temptations, I beg you, defile me, nor separate me from you, but may they rather purify me and unite and join me with you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who gave himself up to preach repentance, to call to you disciples, and from them choose the twelve apostles to be the especial heralds of the faith, 
gathering together the children of God that were scattered abroad. Draw me after you, and powerfully excite my heart to love you. Do not permit me to neglect the grace with which you called me, but make me ready to despise the world and all perishable things, following you, taking your humility and charity as my example. Give me grace to look for you alone, and with earnest longing to sigh continually after you. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 5. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavour, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people, that they can see your good deeds and give honour to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish these things, but to fulfil them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, not the stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until everything takes place. So anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I tell you, unless your righteousness goes beyond that of the experts in the law and of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to an older generation, Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subjected to judgment. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with a brother will be subject to judgment, and whoever insults a brother will be brought before the council, and whoever says fool will be sent to a fiery hell. So then, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has an argument against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and reconcile yourself to your brother, and then come and present your gift. Reach agreement with quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court, lest he hand you over to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the warden, and you will be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will never get out of there until you have paid the very last penny. You have heard what it was what was said. Do not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go into hell. It was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a legal document. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first verse of this reading contains a warning to us all. A Christian has to maintain in his belly the fire of his conversion. Now there is a challenge for all of us, for how many of us have grown cooler over the years? When we were first converted, we thought of nothing else but Jesus, the next prayer meeting, and our new Christian friends. We want to invite all our old friends along to discover what we have discovered and share this with them. We have an excitement coursing through our veins. Sadly, it grows cold as a result of time, and we need to pray that the Holy Spirit comes and relights that fire inside us, in order that we, unlike the salt that has lost its flavour, can continue in our usefulness. Jesus warned his disciples that those who lose their saltiness are no longer of any use and will be thrown out. Let us pray that that does not happen to us. Do not let our faith become a habit, but something that keeps our hearts thumping with excitement. Remember, we are the light of the world. We must allow the light of Christ to shine from us 
into the darkest, dirtiest, filthiest places of the world we inhabit, reflecting his light into the smallest of corners. Let us be the moon to Christ's sun, helping banish darkness from the face of the earth. Let our lives be an example of Christ's love in action, so that others will come up and ask us what it is about us that makes us different, so that the honour is given to the Father. Christ has stirred words here in his address to two groups of people. First, there is a comfort for those Jews of a more pious nature who struggle to live according to the law. They knew that they could never achieve perfection, but perhaps they wondered if they had been wasting their time now that Jesus was amongst them, for it appeared to them that he was overturning the law. Not so, he tells them, for he had come that the Old Testament not only stood, but through him and in him was about to be fulfilled in the most wonderful of ways. The second group of people, however, were sorely mistaken, for they thought that the message of Jesus was that they no longer had to worry about the law, that it was going to be irrelevant, and they read into his message a license to behave as they wished. Not so, they are told, for he had come to reinforce the law and not to undermine it. Indeed, not only did he come to reinforce it, but it brought a wholly new interpretation on it. Under the Old Testament, deeds were what mattered according to the teachers of the law. Jesus tells us that this is only a small part of the truth, for it includes what is in our hearts as well. We do not need to murder somebody to kill them. In God's eyes, all that is necessary is to get angry uncontrollably with somebody. More than that, they had developed an argument that some laws were more important than others. Again, Jesus makes it clear that this is not true. And in verse 9, made it abundantly clear that even the least of the law is as important as the greatest. If we think on this for a moment, we can see the point that is being made. Yesterday, I was discussing at home the issue of bullying in school, and I explained that it was important that children clearly understood that any form of degree of bullying was unacceptable and must be met with the severest of punishment. Put simply, it is human nature to explore frontiers, and as sinners, we like to probe to see what we can get away with. The more we can get away with a little sin here and there, the more we will end up being tempted to try a bigger sin. Consider, perhaps, in this context, Adam and Eve, and the saga that unravels in Genesis 3. Was their sin so very great? A stolen piece of fruit. Perhaps in the scheme of things, no, it wasn't. But it was sin, and it is only a few more lines in the Bible until we find the first murder. All sin is offensive to God, and by disappear, disobeying what appeared to be a stupid rule about a piece of fruit, Adam and Eve broke forever the harmony and uniqueness of their love for God, in the same way that the smallest pebble can destroy the biggest window beyond any form of human repair. Jesus reinforced the Old Testament law, and in fact extended it to include what was in our hearts as well as in our hands. The law of the New Testament, the new commandments that he gave, merely sit on top of the original and sum them up succinctly. What he was to go on to offer, though, was hope to the pious that, through his passion, there would be a remedy available to make them acceptable once again to God. Jesus, in tackling his critics, for, as we have just been discussing, it had been said that he had come to abolish the law and the prophets. The reality it was that he had come to bring a fresh and more relevant perspective to it. 
The experts in the law, the Pharisees, are a good example, looked at the letter of the law and interpreted this according to the heritage of the Old Testament. Because they looked at the letter of the law and not the purpose or the exercising of that law, they tended to miss the point and concentrated wholly on the outward show of the law, not the goings-on in the hearts and minds of the people. For example, in verse 21, Jesus refers to the law against murder. For most of us, this would appear to be cut and dry. If you deliberately set out to go and kill somebody, that is murder and that is the law. Jesus looked further than this and pronounced that it applied to all those who got uncontrollably angry with another, for anger is what gives rise to murder. If you harbour bad thoughts against someone, you may as well have murdered them. Agreed, there is a difference of degree here, and I'm quite sure that if we were angry with someone for a while, God will not judge us as though he had killed, we had killed them. But the point is that it is the beginning of a sin. It is the opening of a window that will allow sin into our hearts. However, this is to miss the point. But Jesus refers to those who go around with anger in their hearts, pretending that all is well, going to church to take communion, going through all the motions of being a good Christian, whilst at the same time having an angry heart. This is the sin that Jesus talks about. For if we are angry, we are in sin. First, we must resolve our anger in reconciliation, and then we can go to church with clean hands and a pure heart. We are given the example of a man being taken to court over a debt, and regardless of the rights and wrongs of the case, it is always better to settle things before they go to court, even on the steps of the court if necessary, because once the matter gets in front of the judge, who knows what the outcome might be. If the judge thinks that you have been wasting the court's time by being stubborn, who is to say what penalties he might throw at you? Jesus then turned his teaching to the subject of adultery. But although the message given can be applied to all sin equally, the subject of adultery provides a good example. The words used by Jesus would have seriously shocked the Jews because they were completely at odds with what they were taught was the correct interpretation of the law of Moses. This allowed a man to divorce his wife for as little reason as being annoying. But the divorce had to be served in writing. It could not be done verbally in anger. But it is, however, an abiding principle that marriage is forever, not to be entered into lightly and absolutely not to be torn up because you find yourself preferring the thoughts of someone else. Thus, adultery starts with the I in all cases, and following the advice of Jesus is it best rooted out and thrown away immediately. That first thought is sufficient, however innocent you try and pretend it is, for it is a seed that will germinate, given half a chance, and as they say, one thing will lead to another. But it is the same with all sin. You could argue that the difference between sin, a sinful thought, and a sinful act is the absence of opportunity. If you long for something, eventually the opportunity to fulfil that longing will present itself. We should therefore be at all times aware of the danger of sinful thought and pray that they might immediately be identified and destroyed rather than ignoring them and pretending that there is no problem. Let us pray. O Lord, we beseech you mercifully to receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may perceive you and know what things they might do and also have grace and power faithfully to fulfil the same. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.